You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that is broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Borspuya. In this week's program, we interview Sarah Peace, social activist and artist on FGM and secularism. Yeah, it's a brilliant interview. We'll also be talking about the recent terrorist attacks in Iraq and Pakistan. Bangladesh and Islam as a state religion, a fatwa against, get ready for this, cartoons, and a village in Iraqi Kurdistan that has eradicated FGM. Stay with us. In the week that passed, we've heard of two further terrorist attacks against people following the terrorist attack in Brussels. One is, of course, in Iskandaria, Iraq, where a children's football match was targeted. There were 32 killed. 17 of them were between the ages of 10 to 16. It, it was targeting Shia Muslims. Uh, and in uh, Pakistan, of course, in Lahore Park, we know that they attacked a children's park where there were 70 killed, 300 injured, many of them children. They were targeting Christians, but of course Muslims have been killed as well, and that's exactly what they do. They target people indiscriminately. They don't need excuses. They just want to kill. And that's the nature of uh, fascism of 21st century. Definitely. Indiscriminate sort of killing. Um, and it doesn't matter as long as you, you disagree with them. For them, it doesn't matter. As long as you disagree with them, you know, you are um, liable to be uh, eliminated and, and killed. And this is not just limited to Daesh. Daesh is the ultimate form of this. Um, you'll see that in Iran, for example, Islamic Republic of Iran does that. Just about to, um, you know, um, remove the eye of, uh, you know, blind somebody as a form of punishment. Or the leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the great, greatest of the Supreme old uh, leader, leader, has said, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the future belongs to uh, missiles, and not that just, is. not just sort of negotiations, yeah. missiles. Yeah. And, you know, you, you have Islamists in um, Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, anywhere. In Europe, you'll see mm -hmm. uh, there's no limits. And I think we need to recognize this is pure fascism. Yeah, and we need to recognize them as, as, as a fascist Fascism. movement. And deal with them as such. Yeah, and what, what's interesting is someone had mentioned, you know, that well, people in Brussels or people in the uh, football stadium hadn't really said that they disagree with the Islamists, but the fact of the matter is that anyone who isn't like them, and they are such a tiny minority, really, of fascists, anyone who isn't like them is open to be killed, no questions asked. And that's why they target children, young, old, women, men, whatever religion and nationality, including many Muslims, because it's you know a question of just killing anyone who's not like them. Absolutely, and I think this uh, recognition of these characteristics, that is a fascist movement, it's a precondition for resolving and dealing with this uh, uh, movement. And you, we, we must, everybody must recognize this for what it is, and then the solution is actually like any f other fascist movement which has political power, and he has a lot of influence, the world needs to respond to this, and this is so urgent. Yeah, it's, rather than saying, uh, you know, well, possibly Charlie Hebdo offended them, that's why they had to kill them. Well, you know, the Bangladeshi bloggers were hacked to death because they were offensive, questioning and criticizing religion. Rather than blaming the victims, when it's recognized that it's a fascist movement, then it becomes very clear that they don't need excuses. So please stop justifying them and also stop appeasing them. It's not just a question of ISIS uh, that's you know part of the problem, but also other forms of Islamist groups and states from Saudi Arabia to the Iran regime to the, the little ones here and there, Boko Haram, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I think that, that's such an important point as a solution. There, there are a lot of discussions 
uh, around the world and experts are discussing how to do this. The best way is to compromise with them. They give an example of the Islamic regime of Iran. That's not a solution. You can't negotiate and, uh, and, and try to absorb um, Islam and Islamism into the, you know, um, the structure of the human society, they needs to be isolated and, and removed, really. Yeah, and I just, uh, last week I was in Paris with Dia Khan, who's making a film on uh, free expression and atheism in the Middle East, North Africa, and those from Muslim backgrounds, as well as Nadia Alfani, who's the Tunisian filmmaker, Maria Mahele Lucas, who's an Algerian sociologist, and Walid Al Hosseini, who's a Palestinian atheist. And I think Nadia Alfani raised a really important point, and she said that we need to, you know, create this mass peace movement. In the past, they had, you know, these huge movements for peace against, for example, the Vietnam War, and just demanding peace, disarmament, that sort of thing. We need that again. Obviously, not the sort of false peace where there's peace in name only, um, but you know, and compromise. and compromise, but real peace uh, linked movement, with yeah. social justice and linked not to governments, but to mass social movements. Yeah, I, I think that's a good and point. I think, I think that point of mass social movement, people need to get angry, people need to be united against this fascism across the world, and it has no boundaries. Is not limited to Europe. Is not limited to Middle East. Is not limited to America. It's everywhere. It's a. It, it needs a global mass movement to say enough is enough, and the Islamists must be defeated. They're fascists, and we need to deal with them as such. Yeah, and also that the reality is that when the focus is only on Europe or only on the West, you fail to see that this is a global movement, and it needs a global response and solidarity amongst people across borders and, and boundaries. That's key. And, you know, one of the other issues that's key, obviously, is the concept of secularism, something that's often vilified. Uh, people are ap apologetic about it nowadays. You know, it, it's as if it's shameful to say one is a secularist to some extent. If you promote secularism, you, you're considered militant and extremist. And in fact, secularism is so key. And one example of this attempt is in Bangladesh, where there was a petition that's very many years old calling for an end to Islam as the state religion. And what's really interesting is how recent this uh, Islam has become the state religion of Bangladesh. I think it's 1988. In the 80s, that's right. And this is after the rise of the political Islamic Definitely. movement, after the, the um, Iranian sort of revolution was defeated by the Islamists effectively, and they hijacked the result of that revolution and established the Islamic Republic of Iran. You'll see the rise of that movement across uh, Middle East, North Africa, and suddenly Bangladesh uh, becomes an Islamic state. It has a constitution. Um, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh they said that we're not going to consider this. Of course, Islamists sort of drum this, this as a victory for themselves. But the question is remain, is mm. that, uh, you know, and, and there are Bangladeshi uh, brothers and secularists who have said, that actually, this is not the end of it. We are going to fight to remove Islam for, as official yes, religion. Yes, so it's not of an Islamic state, but Islam is the official sure, religion. That's so, right. But obviously that colors everything. And, and, and sure, but uh, I mean, it, it's clearly it's, it's, it's a problem, but it needs yeah. is not end of the no, uh, story and it needs to be removed. Definitely. This week we interviewed Sarah Peace, who is a social activist and artist. She's also founded the Secular Voices Project. We talked to her about FGM, the fight against it, as well as the excuses in its defense, cultural relativism, and the importance of secularism. It's an interesting interview. Stay with us and watch it. Sarah Peace, welcome to the program. I wanted to ask you about your Secular Voices project. Tell us about it. So Secular Voices is a campaign by Fireproof Library and the idea is to collect a range of perspectives from secularists and humanists around the world. So the idea is to enable children to hear from different people, um, just be able to imagine the possibility of unbelief as an option because for me when I was growing up I wasn't even aware that there was such a thing as being uh, agnostic or being a humanist or being a secularist and I think it's just a way to open up new ways of thinking um, and to allow children to explore the world differently. 
Especially because children often only hear this relig religious point of view. It seems to be so dominant now, doesn't it? Yes, I think indoctrinating children into religion is something that parents just do naturally. I think very few parents consciously make the effort to expose their children to a range of religious perspectives. So I think it's a good way to just open up that world, open up that room for conversation, allow children to ask those questions which they usually can't ask at home or elsewhere. Given the fact that religion seems to be so dominant, is your promotion of secularism another form of indoctrination possibly? I think that in the West now, it's quite funny that secularism is being rejected so viciously because secularism really is not a threat. I, I don't see it that way. Um, but in some factions of society, it's been rejected very strongly, you know, on the basis that it's, um, it, it imposes a Western world view which is untrue, really, because African traditions before Christianity and Islam had animist or non-believing worldviews. So, yeah, I, I find it funny how um, secularism and humanism is, is being rejected. And part of that rejection comes with, um, you know, Westerners wanting to stay neutral on issues like FGM. So an example of that was what happened at Goldsmiths recently during my seminar where my lecturer actually she refused to make a to, to, to take a, a stand on FGM and just said that well there's you know another way of looking at it that FGM unveiling are responses to colonialism and that to um, critique FGM is to go back to humanism and secularism which informed western civilization so western western civilization um just the western way of life has just been demonized to such a degree um that there's a reactionary movement now to just counter that in any way shape or form regardless of the implications and one of those um, examples we're seeing is people embracing veiling and fgm and even just lumping those two things together because they're not the same you know veiling is not permanent it doesn't inflict any harm on the body itself you can always unveil in your private home but with fgm i mean it's a lifelong consequences that women have to live with but somehow anything that is um different to the west is championed as better as more righteous just because it is different you know because it, it is different doesn't mean that you know it, it is necessarily correct um of course there is a danger of um people thinking that anything that is different is savage yes i i understand that and i understand that you know there are people who look down on the ways of other cultures so it's about finding a reasonable balance in between so on one hand you know we have to be able to we should be able to look at every issue on a case by case basis and not just make sweeping generalizations about you know issues like fgm the, the consequences are far too great i mean you you call it a betrayal how can one stay neutral on something like fgm it's outrageous really isn't it so for me coming from nigeria i live i was born in nigeria i lived there until i was 15 years old so i moved to england you know thinking that i'm moving into just a more advanced society because everything just works so much better. But then to be in a British university and to be told that to take an anti-FGM stance is to be propagating colonial ways of thinking, I just find quite um, ridiculous, which is why I described it as a betrayal, because it is a betrayal of women's rights. You know, human rights should come before anything else. Um, and even if we want to apply degrees of cultural relativism, it shouldn't be on an issue like FGM because what is at stake is so great and that's why I felt that I had to speak out. So even though I'm still a student under this lecturer, I might have to, to face her, to deal with her again, but I think that is so important for me to speak out, which is what, why I did. 
I mean, in a sense, even though this perspective is seen to be anti-racist, there's this underlying racism there because it sort of says that, well, FGM and, you know, the veil and what, what have you is just part of our culture. It has to be respected, even though so many people are opposing it. I think the problem with a lot of anti-racist activism um, in the UK is that it completely positions itself as the opposite of everything that is traditionally English. So what they do is they just lump all cultures together. So if you're African, you know, you're seen as a different culture that should be respected as opposed to interrogated. So for instance, if you look in the um, social care um, system, you know, if a black parent, you know, abuses a black child, they should be, you know, taken up on that. Um, but usually social workers sometimes are a little bit scared to um, act on this because of the fear of being called racist and this is playing out in other um, parts of society you know so you get doctors also being a little bit hesitant to um, report domestic violence when it's Asian women that are involved but if it's white women they would flag it up so I think it is a different type of racism in the sense that because we come from different cultures they don't want to to deal with us in the same way and in a way they're holding us to a lower standard that that isn't right. If they see us as human beings, then they should expect the same from us. And they shouldn't, definitely shouldn't make excuses on our behalf. I mean, what would you say to people who do that exactly, the effects that it has on you personally, on women's rights in general? Well, it is holding back our work, you know, it, it is limiting our achievements and it is, it actually, it can get quite extreme especially when they try to stifle debates on um, ban speakers or censor work that has been carried out on these issues um, for the fear of being labelled racist. I think um, it is actually quite dangerous really um, for people who are good, who, who are well meaning, who, who mean well, who want to integrate other cultures but I, I think that's um, yeah, they, they just need to um, to listen to, to listen to women from these cultures, campaigners from those backgrounds who are actually trying to change their culture from within, and allow them to do that as opposed to trying to fight for them, which really just causes more damage. How important do you think secularism is in all this? I think that secularism really is the key. Um, I'll use my country as an example where 50% of the population are Muslim and the other half are Christian. We do have a small population, about 5% of animists as well. Um, I think that secularism is the key to kind of bringing those communities together. If people can try to understand that religion might be good for them, but it, it is best practice in private. So not bringing it into the workplace, into school, indoctrinating children. I don't think that, I think children should be exposed to different worldviews, but I don't think that they should be committed to any particular religions until they're over 16 because it, it leads to segregation in society. You know, we tell children from a very, very young age that their religion is right and they have a right to express that religion anywhere. And then when they grow up and they meet people who disagree with some of those views, they get offended because that's all they've ever known. So it's so, so important to, to not um, restrict children to particular worldviews and yeah that's where secularism comes in so we need more secularism and humanism in schools um, and elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Sarah Peace. I mean you know when I heard this whole thing at Goldsmiths University again Goldsmiths where you, she's got a professor talking about how we need to be neutral to issues like the veil and FGM, that it is linked to women's agency and criticizing it is part of a colonial project. I mean, I think, seriously, they have lost the plot completely. The termites have spread <laughs> that far and you could it's see... Rotten, just <laughs> rotten to the core. And you could see, um, you know, this is the nature of sort of post-colonial supposedly uh, definition of the world that it meets, you know, uh, its end uh, effectively that um, justifies the most reactionary um, elements in society 
um, and tries to sort of uphold that. This is, this is you know, you, you'll see that in a lot of universities. Intertextuality, you know, you name it, or the contextual, contextualization of the situation. You, that means, you know, forget about the main topic <laughs> and try to explain it away. Um, and also, I think that's, you, you could see this is very closely linked. And the, you know, the anti-colonialists now, they're meeting the Islamists and they all merge together and it becomes a sort of a bastard <laughs> child that we could see. That's how he's treating the issue of FGM, veil and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, and to think that, I mean, you know, the, the horrors and tortures of FGM, 125 million women and girls alive today that have been cut, that have been mutilated. And then you have professors sitting at universities in Europe where many girls continue to face these horrors, um, you know, and, and having nothing to say about it, nothing critical to, to say about it, and instead being critical of those who stand up against it as being part of a colonial project. I mean, the racism of this perspective that feigns to be anti-racist is so clear. And, and you could see why the result of this uh, um, line of thinking is the um, sort of um, stop the Bork coalition type of association with Islamist, uh, um, um, Galloway type of thing, yeah. which is always sort of in bed with the dictators in Middle East and Islamists. Disgusting. And, you know, that type of uh, uh, sort of politics that the... Uh, supposedly the, the, the colonial sort of people who've historically have suffered, anything they say it's, it's good and we need to respect that. And um, any human criti humane critic of that is even Even from people who are from those suffered. backgrounds, who've suffered those backgrounds, even them, they're, you know, they've, they've just bought into the anti-colonial, the post-colonial. Absolutely. Uh, and the, when the voice yes. of that people actually suffering from this and resisting this fascism, um, of today, uh, that the voice is heard, this movement becomes the anti-colonial sort of pro-Islamist movement becomes really reactionary and rotten to the yeah. core. Oh, rotten. Rotten. Oh, rotten. Mufti Arif Qasmi from the Darul Ulum Dio band, uh, you know, surprisingly, he's given a fatwa given the fact that we did find a scientific correlation between long names and stupidity. <laughs> Clearly, it doesn't matter how long your name is. If you issue fatwas, you're just plain stupid. And he's issued a fatwa against cartoons, and he's got this wonderful intellectual reasoning. I mean, I think the you know rashness of our era would be astounded by these uh, reasonings and it's very simple philosophers please sit please down take note take note at, <laughs> and work out the reasoning um is mind-boggling cartoon is a picture hmm. can i Two. just say before you go any further i'm sure his picture is published <laughs> i'm sure yeah. he's got videos recorded and distributed but never mind carry on and we've had you know, our eyes have been seared watching, looking at them. But so one cartoon is a picture. Hmm. Two, it's not for children. I thought it is for children. Well, uh, listen, he's cartoons are he designed says for it's children. It's not, and he's the intellectual, rational. You know, he's rationalizing. The Islamist philosopher. And three, it should not be watched. <laughs> I've sold completely. I mean, when I go home. My 10-year-old son is not going to be watching cartoons anymore. I'm going to redo my logic. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, is crazy. So we warned you. Can I just say, I've heard his name before. Well, you might have because he's issued many different fatwas, including on women being banned from being receptionists, women wearing jeans, perfume which has alcohol in it, tattoos. Oh, and of course, waxing from the knees to the navel. Big no-no. Big no no. Rotten. <laughs> Rotten to the core. Rotten. It's got against the children this time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
The slice of life this week is from Iraqi Kurdistan, a village called Tutakal, near three hours away from Arbil, the capital where FGM has now been eradicated. Children that are now being born are no longer being mutilated. And it's all as a result of a project between this group called Wadi and uh, UNICEF, where they're providing school services in various villages in return for them eradicating and stopping FGM. And of course, now there are seven villages in Iraqi Kurdistan where FGMs don't take place anymore. Of course, you know, I, I, I understand don't that this is a post-colonial project don't and they've mention internalized it at, colonialism. At the, don't mention at Goldsmiths or no. so as. Yes, it, yes. Just, it just doesn't work there. Yeah. It messes up the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this is a good news, really, in a way that shows the, uh, the awareness and the uh, social campaign. Um, and uh, mothers and people have said, you "Don't come near my my children. If you come, I kill you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what they've said, and I think this this is a brilliant sort of project. And I think everybody should take note. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that they're actually uh, thinking of working with UNICEF to eradicate FGM in that area in the next five years. So yes, we need to support them. We need to push forward because it has been banned. FGM has been banned in Iraqi Kurdistan, I think, since so uh, yeah, since when was it? Quite a while now. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the sort of day-to-day -day grind that needs to be done in order to and so organize against not on, it. Not only legal sort of... Yeah. Uh, um, um, Persuading communities. And also bringing communities involved, yeah. getting people together. Yeah. And this is a brilliant pro project and we need to support it. Yeah, definitely. Well, we've reached the end of our program. Before we go, we do like to tell you that we're going to be away for two weeks. I know, I know. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to survive without us. You can watch reruns over and over again. Uh, and, and, you know, drink lots of wine and think about how much you miss us and yada, yada, yada. We'll be back in two weeks' time. We'll try to come up with some good ideas. And we'll try. Yeah, we might not. Look. We'll just, I think we, we like not. it the way it is, but we'll have a look. We'll see. <laughs> if you got any ideas and suggestions about the format of the Send program, it to us, yeah. let us know. We'll uh, be glad to hear them. Yeah, so have a great two weeks and we will see you when we get back. Until then, bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, 
artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.